Coming up on Network Africa. Ugandan military raids the offices of opposition party National Unity Platform. Ghana reports new COVID-19 variants as cases continue to rise in the country. Plus, death toll in Sudan's Darfur violence rises to 80. Welcome to Network Africa. I'm Layo Adegoki. Let's begin today by taking a look at some of the stories that made headlines over the weekend. On Saturday, election officials in Uganda announced President Yoweri Museveni as the winner of a January 14th election, but his main rival, Bobby Wine, alleged widespread fraud, asking citizens to reject the result. The Electoral Commission declares Yoweri Museveni Tibuhaburwa Kaguta elected president of the Republic of Uganda. As the results were announced, supporters of Mr. Museveni danced in the streets of Kampala. A small number of supporters dressed in yellow bled music to celebrate his victory, while soldiers and police were out in force patrolling the capital. However, opposition leader Bobby Wine's party said on Sunday it was preparing to challenge President Yoweri Museveni's election victory, condemning what it called the house arrest of the opposition leader. We have evidence of bout staffing and other forms of election malpractice. And after putting it together, we are going to take all measures, I repeat, all measures that the law permits to challenge this fraud. The United States and Britain issued statements on Saturday calling for investigations into fraud reports and other concerns over the electoral process. The campaign and election were marked by a deadly crackdown by security forces on opposition candidates and the supporters and an internet shutdown. On Sunday, riots and violent clashes between Tunisian police and protesters broke out in the capital Tunis and several other cities for the second consecutive day as the country faces an unprecedented economic crisis. Protesters, most of them teenagers, blocked roads and threw stones at police. Police fired water cannons and tear gases to disperse them. About 240 people were arrested. Egypt has unveiled a significant new archaeological discovery at the Saqqara necropolis south of Cairo, including 54 wooden coffins, many of which can be tracked back to 3,000 years to the New Kingdom period. A major discovery that we found in the shadow of the steep pyramid, the oldest pyramid in Egypt. But my excavation has happened near the pyramid of Titi, the first king of dynasty VI, about 4,200 years ago. The most important thing that we found, we found a temple near a pyramid of a queen. Inside the temple, a name, a new name of a queen. Her name was Nit. She was the wife of the King Titi, and this will add a small part about the history of the Old Kingdom. The coffins or sarcophagi include the first dating back to the New Kingdom to be found at Saqqara, a UNESCO World Heritage Site that is home to the Steppe Pyramid, the Tourism and Antiquities Ministry said in a statement. Carved in human form and painted in bright colors, many of them are still intact. To our main stories for today, the spokesperson for Uganda's biggest opposition party, National Unity Platform, NUP, says offices where agents were gathering material for an election petition have been raided by military officers. Joel Senyonyi claims that the party was in the process of collecting election results forms that show evidence of irregularities in last week's election. He adds that the NUP party leader Bobby Wine's home remains cordoned by by the military. President Yoweri Museveni, who won a sixth term in office, has denied these reports of election irregularities. 
Meanwhile, the five-day internet shutdown in Uganda has been lifted, although social media is still blocked and only accessible through VPN. The internet was shut down on Wednesday night, just hours to go before polling stations opened for Thursday's general elections. This was shortly after Facebook apparently suspended hundreds of pro-government Ugandan accounts. While commenting about Facebook's decision, President Yoweri Museveni said there was no way anyone would come to Uganda and decide what was good or bad. Well, we have joining us now on the program African Affairs Analyst Yinka Oyeniji for more analysis on Uganda's election. Thank you so much for speaking to us on the program. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Now, what do you make of incumbent President Museveni's win that has now given him his sixth term in office? Okay, so um, I think that it is uh, important to be able to uh, do uh, clear analysis without uh, so much of sentiment, okay? So uh, there's that possibility that if people will decide how many times they want an incumbent to uh, to remain elected or to be re-elected or to remain in office. What he has been able to do is to uh, drive the instrument of constitutionality in that country for his own personal interest. And that does happen. So you may find that it's the same individual translating uh, from one regime to the other as democratically elected. Okay. So when we look at um, leaders perpetuating themselves in office, we must be careful to ensure that they don't use the instrument of constitutionality, so to do. It's the same way that um, Nigerians have been clamoring about the 1999 constitution, that we need uh, a wholesale, don't think a wholesale amendment, but I think we need another uh, constitution entirely to be able to ensure that democratic tenants are uh, remain in place. Well, you know, Bobby Wine, the opposition is crying foul, and he says his, his party says they plan to challenge this result. Now, seeing how politics is in Africa, does Bobby Wine stand any chance of success? Yeah, so Bobby Wine's uh, challenge to the incumbent is not uh, what you call a short distance race. Uh, this is a paradigm shift. Is is trying to undo something that began even before the 80s. Museveni has been around for a while before me becoming president in 1986, uh, thereabouts. So we shouldn't think that in another month or two, Bobby Wine is going to become uh, president or something is going to happen. What we should consider is number one, they've got decisive representation in the parliament, so that will give the next government some kind of. Uh, Opposition, quality opposition, and of course, uh, I mean, it's a it's landmark. Uh, youths all over Africa are already thinking if it can be done in Uganda, then we must have some kind, we must draw some kind of courage there. And even the incumbent president himself knows that he, he needs to use extra judicial, extra democratic means of enforcing himself as a president, as you can see from the news that you have highlighted. So the next president of Uganda, no matter how long may take will probably be Bobby Wine, the same way uh, you have it in uh, Liberia. So he's, he's put the markers down, and that shows the trajectory that the country is going, regardless of, of, of the hindrance or resistance to, to the light that, that they are trying to ignite in Uganda. Now, Mr. Oyeniji, uh, you mentioned rightly that uh, Mr. Museveni has been in power since 1986. Now, this win gives him five more years to rule. What else do you think he has to offer, you know, after all these years in power? However, he did mention stability, but then he's been in power for 35 years. What he has to offer is what you are saying already. If you have a country or you have a region that's clamping down on free speech, that is manipulating media, that is using security agents to clamp down on every voice of opposition. That shows the trajectory. It has absolutely nothing to offer other than to, for, for Uganda to remain stagnant. Unfortunately, stagnancy is not uh, bad in itself, other than the fact that there will be other countries will leave them behind. This would have been a, a lofty moment to say, uh, with respect to the pandemic, uh, with respect to people moving forward globally in the area of technology, this would have been a time to install someone with fresh ideas to be able to help Uganda, not necessarily to catch up with uh, first-class countries, but to start driving the trajectory towards uh, quality development. That chance has been missed right now. And what you have 
there won't be peace for the short foreseeable future as the body lines are still out there and this calm down is ongoing what could be done at this time i'm not even saying cancel the elections is to consider how you can maintain the peace without necessarily reaching for that human rights and then let's see where we go from there the next electoral cycle five years is not a long time and then we talk as if we are god we are not god who knows what will happen tomorrow okay but the opposition out there that Bobby Wine represents must be strengthened. And then we'll see there is a possibility, not to stop Bobby Wine and the parliament from suggesting uh, roadmaps for development for the country. That's how it is. Uh, the president has absolutely nothing new to add at this point. Thank you so much, African <laughs> Affairs Analyst Yinkao Yeniji. Thank you for joining us on Network Africa. Thank you for having me in this new year. Well, back here in Nigeria, many public and private schools across the country reopened today after a long break. In the commercial city of Lagos, students resumed in most public and private schools visited by our correspondents this morning with strict compliance to COVID-19 guidelines. Although the turnout appeared low, our correspondent in John Mekwa reports that adherence to COVID-19 guidelines has been in full force in the most of the schools she visited. The Lagos State Commissioner for Education, Folashade Adefisayo, explains that the process will be sustained as long as parents, teachers and the students comply with the safety guidelines. In Lagos State, Students of primary and secondary schools resume for the second term. They are welcome with COVID-19 protocols to ensure their safety. They've even been taught a song to keep them reminded of the new normal. The Commissioner for Education, Falasha de Adifisayo, takes a tour to some of the schools to ensure that laid down guidelines are followed. We are not going to leave the schools alone. We are going to keep coming around, we are going to keep holding meetings, we are going to keep talking to them, we are going to keep encouraging them. I talk a lot because I, to them because I know this thing, they find it uncomfortable. It is. You're uncomfortable, I'm uncomfortable. But like I keep asking, is it, isn't it better to be uncomfortable and alive? In neighboring Ogun State, students are subjected to strict screening and hand hygiene. Then we go to our classes, we have arranged the class in such a way that we provide adequate spacing amongst them. And all in all, our teachers are ready on grant. And can, you can see that about 85% of our students are already in the school. The picture is somewhat different in Eboin State. Students of urban secondary school in the state capital, Abakaliki, are happy to return to school as they are seen heading to classes in groups, most of them without face masks. Not all of them came with uh, face masks. And the uh, government, uh, they were announcing this. We thought that uh, parents are supposed to give their children, equip them. But now we have announced and we are going to announce by tomorrow, nobody will come here without a face mask. In Edo State, that schools will not reopen for now. Some other states, like Edo, this have suspended the reopening of schools in the face of increasing records of daily infections. In Kaduna State, while schools are not allowed to open, the State Polytechnic and the National Open Universities are exempted because they requested for time to write examinations. Well, while some schools are opening here in Nigeria, in Rwanda and Malawi, schools are closing down. We'll give you more details after the break, including this. Welcome back to the program. Rwandan authorities have announced the closure of nursery, primary and secondary schools in the capital, Kigali. Even as the numbers of coronavirus cases continue to rise, they are all to close down from Monday. Education Minister Valentin 
Uwamaria says schools in other provinces will also close if more cases are confirmed there. Schools were reopened in November after being shot for eight months. Now the cases of COVID-19 in the country are on the rise with more than 1,000 new cases and 22 fatalities reported in the last seven days. The country has so far confirmed 11,032 cases with 142 deaths. In the meantime, schools in Malawi will close for at least 15 days from Monday under new restrictions to combat a surge in coronavirus cases. In a televised address, President Lazarus Chakwera also announced a nighttime curfew from 9 p.m. local time. All gatherings will be restricted to no more than 50 people. Now, Malawi is observing a period of national mourning following the deaths of two senior cabinet members who died from COVID-19. A third of Malawi's 300 coronavirus deaths have taken place this month. Now, the president also says the government is allocating a further $2 million to provide health care for staff and equipment. Well, Messi Malikwa is a Malawian journalist who joins us now for more on this story. Hello, Messi. Thank you for speaking to us. How are students and also the parents responding to this 15-day closure of schools? Messi, it seems we can't hear you. You might have to unmute your mic. All right. Mostly, there's been a mixed, there's been a mixed reaction uh, to the recent school closure, uh, but mostly people are okay with the decision. Looking at the new cases that we've We've registered uh, since January 1 this year. Um, so the general feeling before the president announced about the school closure was that uh, they, there wouldn't be any sense in closing schools, whereas other gatherings such as weddings, churches, and funerals continue to take place. So with the new conditions that have been announced, people have welcomed it, considering that... Uh, when schools were happening, more cases were also being registered, and it was like a thousand coverings happening each and every day. All right, now we know Malawi is mourning the deaths of two senior cabinet members. What is the government's plan, you know, concerning vaccines and also vaccination for the people? Recently, the Secretary for Health, Dr. Charles Mansambo, disclosed that Malawi plans to vaccinate 3.8 million people. That's like 20% of the whole uh, population. Uh, this uh, vaccination is going to take place in the first half of 2021. However, uh, he disclosed that since the vaccine cannot cater for all Malawians, it will be for it will be only for healthy workers who are at the forefront fighting COVID-19, as well as older persons aged 65 and above, and those with conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. All right, then. Thank you so uh, much. Since it's, it's in, in, Messi, we're having we're having a bit of audio issues, but thank you. That's Messi Malikwa, a Malawian journalist there joining us from Blantyre. Well, in neighboring Ghana, President Nana Akufo Addo has announced that the country has recorded new variants of COVID-19 at its main airport in Accra. In a televised address, the president says the new variants were found on arriving passengers who have since been isolated. Now, no details were given on the passengers or where they came from. The authorities are determining whether the new variants may have spread to the local population, even as Ghana is experiencing a spike in coronavirus cases. It is currently recording an average of 200 new cases daily, with severe cases being recorded among young people. The increase in cases is attributed to the disregard of public health protocols during the festive season. The police have therefore been instructed to strictly enforce the rules.
Well, doctors in Sudan say over 80 people have been killed in two days of fighting between rival ethnic groups in the Darfur region. Hundreds more have been injured during the unrest in El Ganiya. A nearby camp for displaced people was also attacked during the worst violence since a peace deal was signed last October. International peacekeepers began a phased withdrawal from Darfur earlier this month. Reports say the violence began when an Arab man was stabbed to death by a man from a non-Arab group, leading to an exchange of gunfire. The Sudanese government says it is sending reinforcements to the area to protect the civilians. Now, demand for chocolate has fallen in the U.S. and Europe, and that's causing havoc in countries like Côte d'Ivoire, where cocoa bean producers find prices are falling and their stock is unwanted. A death of beans buyers due to sluggish global is forcing some farmers to sell their beans below the guaranteed farm gate price so as to reduce stocks piling up in their farm warehouses. People in the United States and Europe are eating less chocolate and the impact has been felt thousands of miles away in Côte d'Ivoire. The West African country is a major producer of the key ingredient, cocoa. Now unsold beans are piling up with around 100,000 tons stranded in the bush. <laughs> We're having problems selling our cocoa because potential buyers say they can't pay 1,000 FCFA per kilo and sell it back to the Lebanese buyers for the same price. I am really worried my products will remain unsold. With prices fixed at a minimum of $1.82 per kilo, this farmer is afraid buyers simply won't be interested. The bottleneck follows a request from chocolate buyers in Europe and the U.S. for a delay in deliveries. Companies including Mars, Ashi and Barry Calibut all buy from Côte d'Ivoire. Now, trader Alfred Yao says the downturn in orders is hitting livelihoods. <laughs> It has a negative impact because the day before yesterday, we saw students in the streets because their parents did not find buyers for their cocoa. So they did not have money to send their children to school. On the field, the cooperative also needs to sell. If we don't manage to sell or if we don't manage to buy, we're stuck. If it doesn't work, it's because the money can't reach us. With bins piling up at ports too, regulators are trying to stem the flow of products from growers. While eating less chocolate might be good for consumers in the West, the downturn is a beta medicine for African farmers. And that's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Adegoki.